Of all the cases the International Court of Justice has heard since its first case in the 1940s, the majority of their caseload has been settling territorial boundary disputes. However, not many of the cases have gone to the court through special agreement. Rough estimates are that maybe one in every 10 cases get to the court by special agreement. And of all those cases, a potential Belize and Guatemala case will likely be the first to be decided by their respective citizens through a referendum. So it's no surprise that Belizeans have many questions to be answered about the processes of the court. One of the primary ones is the likelihood of a fair trial and the possibility of a positive outcome. Today on our media tour in The Hague, we visited Leiden University to sit down with former ICJ clerk, now assistant professor, Dr. Julia Pinzauti, and Dr. Eric de Brabander, director of Grotius Center for International Dispute Resolution, to get some answers. First of all, you have to think about the composition of the court. And the composition of the court uh, uh, reflects a certain geographic distribution. Uh, with uh, seats that are allocated on a regional basis. So there is uh, Western uh, countries, uh, Latin American countries, African countries, Asian countries. And the composition of the court has changed throughout the years as more and more states became members of the United Nations. So I would say that there was in a historical period, a certain imbalance towards the group of uh, Western European states. Now that's no longer the case anymore. And on the current bench, there are two judges from Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, Judge Cansado Trindade and uh, Judge Robinson. There have been quite a few examples of disputes brought before the court, which were a typical situation of David and Golia uh, with a big country and a very small country. And you may recall that in, in some quite important cases, the court has actually sided with the small country. Nicaragua, US is an old case, but every state is equal before the law and the two parties in litigation, the applicant and the respondent are equal. There is procedural fairness before the court. As the top court of the United Nations and a body whose ideal is to achieve peace through law, does fairness equal compromise in the ICJ rulings? The court is indeed the principal legal body of the United Nations. It still is a court that sits and stands on its own, right? So their end mission is dispute settlement contributes to peace, but their 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 objective is not to bring peace. Their objective is to settle disputes. And the court takes a relatively mm. technical and very judicial approach to this, right? So they will really look at the law, apply the law, and then they will not disregard the law because peace dictates otherwise, right? So they will really apply the law. I think that's, they consider that they're a judicial instance and that they're always to apply the law. But I wouldn't say, to be honest, that the court by definition rules only and with the idea in mind that they need to find a balance between the rights and obligations. I mean, I, I think we have had several cases where the court has made decisions that were really in favor of one state and not in favor of the other without much compromise. And in this case, it's, it's, it's a relatively black and white decision, right? I mean, the question is, is that the boundary or not? One of the champion strengths of the Belize case, as we've been told by those who agreed to go to the ICJ, is that we's Belize, and previously the British, have always effectively occupied this territory. We asked the experts to explain the principle of occupation as it would play out in court. The court has had many cases, um, so you have many rules, but it's, it's, it's a very factual-based decision. So... It's very difficult, to be honest, to tell you this is the rule that will prevail over that rule. Because every situation is dependent, and we both looked yeah. in detail at the case, the dispute between Belize and Guatemala. It's complex. It's complex. But you roughly have two types of arguments to make. One is we have legal formal title. And the other one is to say, even if we don't have title, we have been there. Right? That's put, put it relatively simply, yeah. the two stra strands. And the court, these are then subdivided into separate rules, and the court then sees 
in light of the specificities of the situation, whether one prevails over the other. But the principle nonetheless is, if you have formal title, that is your sovereign, um, it's your land, unless there is something that happens that changes the title. Occupation is not necessarily the right word. The, the, the principle is that you have to be there and exercise competences in a sovereign capacity. So, right? so Belize has to be there, but also act as a state. And governing. Yeah. And governing. Yeah. So it's, in French they call it, you have to have acts à titre de souverain, yeah. which means acting as a sovereign. Yeah. On the flip side, the no to the ICJ activists have repeatedly championed that Belize has been accepted as a sovereign state by no less than the United Nations itself, and all but one country. So if we've been recognized by 139 nations, then what do we have to prove? Well, there's one important principle is that recognition of a state never implies the recognition of the boundaries of the state. <laughs> well, I'll expand, that's the same principle, is that if you accept a state, you say, I recognize you as a state, you never recognize the precise boundary of that state. It's the same as joining an international organization doesn't apply recognition of the sovereignty of all other states, otherwise Israel would never have been a member of the United Nations. In other words, based on international law, recognition by the United Nations as a sovereign state does not equate to being recognized for all our 8,867 square miles. Reporting for News 5 from The Hague, I am Marleni Cuellar.